On behalf of staff, Dr. Chayette and myself, welcome to our annual Criminal Justice Advisory Board. Tonight, we will have the distinct honor and pleasure to welcome Chief James P. O'Neill. Before we begin, I would like to acknowledge some of our distinguished guests. Please stand when I call your name or if I call your group. Uh, and audience, please hold the applause till after everybody goes, so we are not here till 10 o'clock tonight. Uh, staff President, Dr. Margaret Fitzpatrick. The members of the Board of Trustees, the members of the President's Council, see some ways, hey. <laughs> um, the members of the Criminal Justice Advisory Board, and I do want to mention them by name because they are um, the ones that are sponsoring this. Uh, there's Dr. Kevin Bar uh, Barrett, he's the Chair of the Criminal Justice Program in Rockland County Community College. Mike Capra, the Superintendent of Sing Sing. Uh, Sydney Dresky, Special Agent Sydney Dresky, U.S. Secret Service. Anna Enright, the Acting Deputy Commissioner, recently promoted, of uh, New York State Department of Corrections and Community Services uh, Supervision. Uh, Sheriff Louis Falco from Rockland County. Commissioner Brian Fisher, retired from New York State Department of Corrections. Uh, Joe Green, retired, uh, Special Agent from uh, U.S. Bureau of Alcohol, Tobacco, and Firearms and explosives. Kevin Hallinan from the Royal Diamond Security International and a lot of law enforcement experience as well. Thomas Hallinan, uh, Hallinan I'm sorry for butchering your name, uh, Special Agent FBI. Uh, James Lick, uh, Licata, uh, Rockland County Public Defender. Uh, Sheriff Leo McGuire, I know he's not gonna be here tonight from Bergen County. The Honorable John L. Molinelli uh, from Bergen County Prosecutor, retired. Uh, Chief of Police, Kevin Nolte. Uh, Kathleen Tower Bernstein, Director of the Rockland County of Probation. Trooper Angela Wood from the New York State Police. The Honorable Thomas Zugabe, District Attorney, Rockland County. So thank you for those folks. The members of our criminal justice community. Are there any other members of the criminal justice community out there? If you do, please stand to be recognized. And the members of government, and I know there's a few folks that were here in the private sector that support stack in the effective and ethical operation of the criminal justice system. I know we had a bunch of folks that were there from there as well. Um, I would also like to thank uh, <clears throat> the members of the student body who assisted tonight, as well as Ginny Dunnigan, our librarian, uh, Pat Lambert, Bob Ambrose, Joe Danini, and their staff who worked so hard to make tonight possible, and they worked really hard to get this place in the condition they should be. Finally, I'd like to thank Dr. Chayette, the architect of the Criminal Justice Advisory Board. She created it, and for her assistance in planning this effort, and I'm embarrassing her because she didn't know I was going to say that. Um, so I, we give them all a hand. The presentation tonight will be followed by a reception and networking session. We encourage students to interact with members of the criminal justice community here tonight. On the table in the rear, we also have information on the college's new MPA program in criminal justice. Please feel free to take one if you're interested in that program and you can also speak to myself or Ellen. Tonight's presentation will focus on the idea of neighborhood policing. This is distinctly different from the generic idea of community policing that most of us know of. Chief O'Neill will also discuss the interaction of neighborhood policing with the fight against terrorism. Now a little bit about James O'Neill, because he's a pretty amazing guy. He was appointed the 43rd police commissioner of the city of New York by Mayor de Blasio in September 2016. He had served previously as the chief of department, the NYPD's highest uniform rank. He was instrumental in developing neighborhood policing, which is renewing and recasting the NYPD's patrol function to provide greater police and community interaction and collaboration. Widely experienced in both the patrol and investigative sides of the department, Commissioner O'Neill is a hands-on police practitioner and a dedicated police reformer. He speaks with urgency about the need for police to evolve if they're to succeed in connecting with communities and about keeping people safe in the 21st century. Police Commissioner O'Neill began his law enforcement career in 1983 with the Transit Bureau, uh, Transit Police. He had risen to, the, uh, to lieutenant by the, the time of the 1995 merger of the Transit Police with the NYPD. As a lieutenant in the NYPD, he worked at the Police Academy 
and the Warren Squad before being promoted to captain and executive officer of the 52nd Precinct in the Northern Bronx. He served as the commanding officer of three successive precincts, Central Park, the 25th Precinct in Eastern Harlem, and the 44th Precinct in Western Bronx. He was CEO of the 25th Precinct during the attacks of September 11th and remembers being proud of the way his fellow officers from across all the department came together to help and protect people during that crisis. It was as CEO of the 44th Precinct, one of the busiest commands in the city, the Commissioner O'Neill began to think seriously about reforming NYPD patrol model. The precinct workload in the NYPD had long been divided between patrol officers who answered a steady stream of calls for service and specialty officers who worked at correcting conditions and community outreach. As Commissioner O'Neill saw it, police departments had been asking their patrol officers to connect with the community members for generations without ever giving them the time or the opportunity to do so. He envisioned a model with fewer specialists and more generalist officers who answered calls, worked at problem solving and local crime fighting, and, elaborated, and collaborated far more effectively with community members. Promoted to inspector and then to deputy chief, Commissioner O'Neill moved to the investigative side of the department, serving tours as commanding officer of the Vice Division, the Narcotics Division, and the Fugitive Enforcement Division. He worked in all three divisions to keep cases focused on reducing crime and supporting the priorities of precinct commanders. In March 2014, he was appointed the commanding officer of, the, uh, of Police Commissioner William Bratton's office and played a key role in the department's re-engineering process, concentrating on operational reforms. As Chief of Patrol from June 2014, he began the development of neighborhood policing by anchoring officers in sectors and providing them with off-radio time to connect with community members and work at local problem solving and crime uh, fighting, which is very unique. He appointed Chief of Department, he was appointed Chief of Department in 24, December 2014, and early on in his term, he helped to lead the department through the shock and mourning that followed the assassinations of detectives Rafael Ramos and Wenjin Liu. Neighborhood policing, which is a crime-fighting plan above all else, has been implemented in more than half of New York City precincts, as well as all of NYPD housing bureau police service areas, and is serving more than three million New Yorkers. It is the largest, best-funded, best-staffed community policing initiative ever undertaken in the United States. Commissioner O'Neill's re reforms are taking hold and will have far-reaching positive influence all across New York City. Commissioner O'Neill grew up in the Flatbush section of Brooklyn, and was one of seven children. He has two sons, Daniel and Christopher. He's an avid hockey player and motorcyclist. He also has earned a Bachelor of Arts degree in government and a Master of Public Administration degree from John Jay. Little side note that I learned tonight, he also was a adjunct at RCC, so pretty neat. Uh, and the interaction with the students that we saw with him downstairs was outstanding, I mean, great. Commissioner O'Neill has a clear vision of where he is taking the New York City Police. Fighting crime is what we get paid to do, he says, but we can't do that unless we achieve full partnership with the community. Unless we have that connectivity, it's not going to work. I would now like to welcome Dr. Margaret Fitzpatrick, the staff president. Please jo join me in welcoming her. Good evening, everyone. Oh, we could do much better than that. Good evening, everyone. Good evening. There you go. All right. <clears throat> so um, I have the privilege of meeting uh, Commissioner O'Neill in December. And that came about because I asked Board of Trustees members to recommend to me who would be best people to give honorary degrees to at commencement and, in fact, offer the commencement address. Dr. Kevin Hallinan in the front here who is a member of our uh, Board of Trustees and, of course, the Criminal Justice Advisory Board, said to me right away, Margaret, I know who we have to go after. We have to go after Commissioner O'Neill. Now, we do have a, a record of having police commissioners receiving honorary degrees from St. Thomas Aquinas College, New York City com Police Commissioners. So I said, great, Kevin paved the way, and down we went. Uh, to Police Plaza in Manhattan. 
As soon as I walked in, I met such a gentleman. Made me feel so welcomed, sat down, had a conversation. I thought to myself, Kevin hit it right on the head. This commissioner is such an outstanding human being. Then I knew we had a home run because he said to me, Dr. Fitzpatrick, I, I would be, it would be my honor to come to commencement and give the commencement address. But before that, I would like to come and meet your students. Wow. This busy guy, 24-7, every day of the week, said, no, not only do I want to come to commencement, but I want to meet your students. So this is who you are meeting tonight, someone who is going out of his way, who exemplifies the values of St. Thomas Aquinas College with integrity and trust. And we are so honored to have you here. Commissioner O'Neill, please come up. Oh, it's really an honor to be here, and it's a pleasure to be here. And I was a uh, adjunct at Rockland Community College for uh, four semesters, and uh, working for Dr. Barrett was 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 a real joy. It's uh, I never I never taught before, and uh, my first semester I taught criminal justice and public policy. And I guess Kevin, Dr. Barrett, was testing me. He just gave me a book and said, "Go to it, and nothing else." So, but it was. Uh, you know, every Tuesday night, it was uh, three hours, and it was, uh, it was a great way to see, to get to meet uh, young people who are interested in something that I've been doing now for uh, 36 years. And it is a, it's, it's a fantastic uh, career choice. I know if you're criminal justice majors, I don't you know, know what you're looking to, to do, the end result there, but I'm sure it probably has something to do with law enforcement, whether it's going into the FBI or Secret Service or or NYPD or any other police department, uh, the, FBI, uh, the FBI is, uh, we have something going on in New York now that it really hasn't been this way uh, uh, before. It's not just neighborhood policing. It's the way all of the law enforcement agencies in New York are collaborating and working together. And that's important. Um, there's great work being done by each and every agency, but no one is looking for the credit. They just want to get the job done. Um, if you pay attention to the news, you know that over the last 19 months, there's been three <coughs> terrorist attacks in New York City. Uh, there was the, my first day, my first full day as police commissioner, September 17th, 2016, was the Chelsea bombing. Uh, and then on Halloween, that same uh, 2017, was the truck attack on the West Side Highway. And then uh, we had a suicide bomber in December of 2017, too. If I think that with those three events happening, what's with happening all over the world, I think people finally are getting to understand that unless we work together, not just law enforcement, not just the prosecutors, but all eight and a half million people in the city and everybody that lives in this metropolitan area, if we don't work together, uh, we're certainly not going to be as safe as, as we need to be. So I, I know there's kind of a mixed audience here, but I, what I really want to talk to uh, is the students. This is a career that uh, is unlike any other. Uh, I started in 1983 as a transit cop. And uh, back in 1983, I don't know if you spend any time in New York City, it's not the way, it's not the way it is now. <laughs> it's not, not even close. In 1983, um, I went through the NYPD Academy. And when we came out, I did three weeks at uh, the Transit Police Academy. We were a separate uh, agency back then. And then, uh, we were sent to patrol. I did three weeks in Midtown Manhattan, and then they sent me up to 146th Street and St. Nicholas Avenue. And I did train patrol from 8 at night to 4 in the morning by myself. And in 1983, the subways were a mess. Uh, there, was, there was crime. Now there's six crimes a day in the subway. Uh, back then, there were probably 100 crimes a day. Uh, but it was a great experience for me, because I, I was a little older. I was 25 when I became a cop. Um, right, actually now, that's the average age. The average age back then was probably 21 or 22. I had worked for an insurance company for, for a number of years. Uh, it was good work, had a lot of good friends. Um, probably if I stayed there, I would have either been unemployed or made a lot of money, so. <laughs> uh, thank you, thanks for that laughing, it was good. Uh, but I, I had to make a choice. 
And I don't come from a cop family. I don't. I have uh, my Uncle Bill, who just passed away last year. He was, a, um, he was married to my uh, dad's sister. He was a lieutenant in, uh, in the NYPD. He taught at uh, Westchester Community College for about 20 years after he retired. He was, he was a great guy, great role model, but that's it. You know, I come from a big family. I have 35 first cousins. Nobody's in law enforcement. Uh, my mom was not happy with my choice. She, I told her that uh, I was going to become a cop, a transit cop, and uh, I'm, I'm the fourth out of seven. And uh, she didn't really talk to me too much for, for, the, for the following year. Not happy at all. She thought it was not something uh, that I should be doing. Uh, I went to school, and uh, this isn't what uh, we're supposed to be doing. But I knew I made the right choice. Once I got out of the academy and then started doing train patrol, and there were, there were all sorts of rules and regulations back there uh, when you were a transit cop. The train runs, we used to take the train, if you know anything about Manhattan, we'd get the train at 168th and Broadway, which is by Columbia, Columbia Hospital, and you'd have to ride that train all the way out to Brooklyn, to uh, the first stop in Brooklyn. And you'd do three round trips a night. But you could only, as you're going through the system, every three stops you had to change cars. This way you'd work yourself through the whole subway car, the whole subway train. And I knew I'd made the right choice the first night, upon train patrol, as soon as you step in, as soon as you stepped into that car, you could see the look of relief on people's faces. That they'd have at least a couple of minutes where they knew they'd be safe. I was, uh, I wasn't sure about my career choice. I really wasn't. But uh, I did that for six months, and uh, it was very rewarding, and it really affirmed my decision to become a cop. Um, after that, uh, I went uh, worked up in the Bronx in uh, District 11, right by Yankee Stadium, if there's any Yankee fans here. I was on patrol there for two years. So whatever your, your aspiration is, if uh, you want to become, somebody said they want to become a homicide detective, if you want to go to emergency services unit, you want to go to aviation and fly that beautiful helicopter that's sitting out on the front lawn, or you want to drive one of our 37 boats, whatever you want to do, you have to start out on patrol. Either patrol in a precinct, we have 77 precincts, or you patrol in the housing bureau, or you patrol in the subway. And it's important that you have that base of knowledge. Because the key to anything you do in policing is your ability to communicate to other people. And we have tons of technology. Every cop has a smartphone. Uh, we have license plate readers. We have facial recognition. We have shot spotter. We have cameras, you know, access to 10,000 cameras. The technology is great. But unless you, as a police officer, can establish a relationship with someone and effectively communicate with them, uh, you're not going to be able to do the job uh, as well as you should be able to do it. Um, I, I, I've had a good career, but as in any, any job that you have, there's ups and downs. Uh, I always tell people it's a great job. It's not always a fun job, but it's a great job. Because you get to have a direct impact on people's lives. And with, if you make a decision to, to do your job right, you have a positive impact on people. If you make a decision, maybe not to work as hard as you could, that's an opportunity lost. So if you're going to go into this field, if you're going to go into this, th this business, and make a commitment. Be totally committed to it. And uh, you will just, each day you go home, you'll be able to look yourself in the mirror and say, you know what? I'm helping moving this world forward. And it's, uh, you're not going to make a ton of money. You're not. Even as the police commissioner, you know, no one's getting rich being a cop. No one's getting rich being in the Secret Service, right? Yeah. No, one's getting, <laughs> no one's getting rich being in the FBI. But there's a lot more to this world than money. And uh, having that sense of satisfaction after a, a hard day's work, uh, you come home, look yourself in the mirror, and you say, you know what, I made the right choice. So if you want to do this, be committed to it. And if, as you're in school now, and I tell this to every recruit class when we, when we swear them in. Make good decisions about who your friends are. Because once you take the test, once you get assigned an investigator, you're going to go through everything. And you don't want to be in trouble. You don't want to have bad friends. Social media, make sure. Uh, be careful about what you're posting. You're going to go through all that. So this is a lifestyle you're choosing. And I've seen way too many kids that come into the academy 
And we have to wait. If to become an NYPD cop, you've got to wait two, three years, sometimes four years before you get on the job. Uh, we don't have a problem with, re with recruitment. You know, come in and they'll make stupid decisions. And we just had a fire, four cops. for uh, They went out drinking one night. Uh, they got into a little bit of trouble. Uh, two of them were still in the academy. It's not what I want to do. And I want people to uh, live fruitful and productive lives. But uh, you have, uh, as a police officer, um, you have to make sure that uh, you do your best uh, to live a good life and, uh, and, and take care of people and treat them with respect and dignity. So after uh, the three de police departments merged in 1995, April 2nd, 1995, I know that because uh, we were the smaller police department and uh, actually we used to call it the hostile takeover. But, uh, <laughs> but it really wasn't. It ended up, uh, ended up being a, a real good thing. Um, I was a lieutenant at the time, and I got to take the NYPD captain's test back in 1997. I was lucky enough to pass it. I got promoted to captain in, this, in uh, November two, of uh, 1997. I was made the executive officer of the 52nd Precinct, which is a pretty busy precinct up in the uh, northern Bronx. Then I went out to, uh, I did that for four or five months. Then I went out and did a narcotic detective operations in, um, in Bedford-Stuyvesant in the 7-9 and the 8-1. And then I was lucky enough to, and this was really, for me, it was a, it was a life changer. Um, I became a precinct commander. Uh, they, they assigned me to the Central Park Precinct in uh, September of 1998. Uh, I was there for two years. Not the busiest place in the world, but definitely uh, people, if something happened in the park, it'd be on you know, page two or three of the post of the Daily News. So we really had to be on top of our game. I did that for two years. I managed to keep crime down. We actually, we actually did something. Uh, I had a detective that worked for me. He uh, discovered that people were making false robbery reports in Central Park, which is this is, this is the great part about being a, a detective. We were getting killed with robberies, and then Louis just started making sure that he, he spoke, he communicated to all the people who said they were victims. And he found a pattern. Most of them were from, um, were from Europe. And what they do is they take out uh, travel insurance. And the day before they go home, they report a robbery in Central Park. And this way, when they got back home, you know, they get some sort of settlement for whatever they said was robbed. But Louis figured that out because he was interviewing someone, and uh, the victim said that they were walking on the East Drive, and some guy came by on a pair of rollerblades and stole, stole, stole his bag. And he goes, wait a second, that was just an episode on the Mod Squad or something. That, that, <laughs> that, didn't, that did not happen. So uh, we, we uh, told a little fib to the victim and said that there were video cameras all over Central Park. And we said we looked at the video, and we didn't see anything happen on the video. And, and, uh, and the person gave it up, and they ended up getting locked up and filing a false police report. But that's, you know, that, that, that's uh, what that did was, you know, I think we, there were 18 people that we arrested that year for, locking, uh, for uh, making false police reports. You know, and this was, a, they were unnaturally skewing the numbers, the robbery numbers in Central Park, making people afraid to go there. So by Louis, Louis doing this and conducting this investigation and getting to the bottom of it, you know, Central Park is uh, and continues to be a, a very safe place. It's 843 acres. It's absolutely beautiful. There's about 100 cops assigned there. Uh, but it is a place, it's the jewel of the city, so we have to make sure we take care of it. So after I was able to do that for two years and uh, they decided, okay, we gave you a precinct where no one lives. Uh, we're going to give you a precinct where people actually live and see how you do with that. <laughs> so they sent me up to the 2-5 in East Harlem. And it's, uh, it's about one square mile, about 40,000 people. Um, it's, uh, it's, it's not the most terribly violent place in New York City, uh, but back in uh, 2000, 2002, uh, there, there were, we probably have 10 to 12 homicides a year, probably 20 to 30 shootings. Within that, uh, within that one square mile. Uh, we, were, we were able to do a lot. Uh, we, we reduced crime uh, over, over my two years there. I was there during 9-11. Um, uh, today, I'm sure uh, most of the people, the older people in this room will certainly never forget. Uh, we had a sergeant and eight cops go down there early in the morning. Thank God they were all all right. But uh, as, as the day went on, we had no, no idea uh, where they were. Uh, it turns out that uh, they were in a concourse underneath 
uh, the towers, there's a, there was a shopping concourse there. It was a sergeant and eight police officers. And uh, they were there when the first tower collapsed. And uh, everything went dark. Uh, they didn't think they had a way out. And this is another thing about being a cop. You can never become complacent. You always have to think about where you are and what you're doing. Uh, between the nine of them, there was only one, one person that had a flashlight. Uh, this kid, a rookie kid, Emmett Mackin. He's uh, actually not in the NYPD anymore. He's working for a police department up in Connecticut. But if it wasn't for Emmett having that flashlight, they wouldn't have found their way out. And they did find their way out, and they all survived. So you know, no matter where you go, no matter what job you do, just make sure you never uh, uh, <coughs> succumb to complacency, because it almost cost, them all, uh, almost cost them all their lives. So I was there for two years, and then I went up to uh, the South Bronx, um, the, the same area I worked in when I was a transit cop, the 44th Precinct. Uh, it's 1.9 square miles. It's about 150,000 people, and I had about 300 cops. And it's, it's, a, it's a tough place. There's a lot of economic challenges up there, a um, uh, lot of violence. When I was there, <coughs> there were probably 20, 20 to 30 homicides, uh, 60 shootings. The uh, violence has definitely been reduced since then over the years. But it was, it was a tough place. But what I learned from that experience is that uh, the cops that, that worked in the 4-4 are absolutely totally committed to, to, to what they do each and every day. And it wasn't just a police officer, it was the community too. It's 150,000 people, uh, not a lot of money. Um, I said there's, there's, there's violence, there's gang issues up there. But as a precinct commander, you get to see all that. You used to go out to community meetings uh, as often as possible, uh, you know, two or three times a week. And you get to see, you get to make a connection to, to the people in New York City. And, and you can see how appreciative they are of, uh, of police officers. <laughs> keeping them safe. Uh, it was, it was a, for me, it was transformational. Uh, I was there for two and a half years. I met uh, so many great people that I still stay in contact with, uh, not, just, not just police officers, uh, but people in the community, too. Uh, I actually have uh, a sergeant that works on my uh, security detail, uh, Angel Arroyo. I think he's right there. Yeah. Uh, Angel, worked, <laughs> Angel worked in the 4-4 with me. And he'll agree that, uh, for me, it was absolutely the best place that, uh, that I've ever worked in my life. Um, so actually, believe it or not, I know this is being taped, but uh, I like that job a lot better than the job I have now. <laughs> uh, so I did that for two and a half years, and it's, uh, it, it really it was a life changer for me. And, you know, we talked about, in the introduction, talked about neighborhood policing and how the, we're changing the way we do business, and I'll get into that a little bit later. But I saw even back then that uh, you know, we wanted our cops to have a connection to the people in the community. But we really weren't giving them the opportunity to do that. If I'm in a sector car, which is a, a, a police car, in the 4-4 on a busy day, a busy tour, you're answering 20 to 25 9-11 jobs, radio runs a day. So you don't have any opportunity to make any connection to anyone except the people calling 911. And then if you weren't doing that, you'd either be assigned to traffic You'd be on a low-level uh, drug enforcement team. Uh, you'd be doing domestic violence. You'd be doing some sort of specialization. Really not giving any of the police officers the opportunity to make that connection. I, I understood that back then. I wasn't in a position to change that. Uh, but now as the police commissioner, we've been uh, doing this for almost three years now. We've been transforming the police department from a traditional policing model to neighborhood policing. And, and what that does, it, it does a number of things. Uh, in the neighborhood policing model, you put the same cops in the same sector every day. Now, instead of having 18 arbitrarily drawn sectors in the 404, now there's five. And each one of those sectors represents a neighborhood. You get the same cops in there every day. And in those sectors, we created a position called a neighborhood coordination officer, which this is a, this is a pretty good job. You're the conduit between the community and the steady sectors. And what that does is it gives ownership to those police officers. This way, if there's a problem today, if I don't take care of that, guess what? When I come back tomorrow, it's still there. In that prior model of policing, I'll be in steady, I'll be in sector Adam Boyd Charlie today. I'll be over in Frank tomorrow. There's really no sense of ownership. We also give the police officers the opportunity to have off radio time. 
this, this model of policing does require more cops and, and the city council and the mayor. Actually, we've increased our head count from 34,000 up to 36,000 over the last couple of years. And you need those additional police officers so you have time off the radio. So you're not running from job to job all day long. You have a 30-year day where you have the opportunity to interact with the people you sworn to protect and serve. And, and you got to think about that too. I don't know if there's too many other jobs in the world where you have to raise your right hand and take an oath. There are some, but as a cop, you do it. And you have to pay attention to that oath. Because your job, number one job, is to keep people safe. And uh, the feedback we're getting from the cops is, is extremely positive. I went back up to visit the 4 4 a couple of months ago. I spoke to two or three NCOs. And you could just hear it in their voices, you see it in their faces. You know, they, they have an opportunity to work with the community, to identify problems, to identify solutions together. And uh, it's, it's, it's a real positive step forward. We're also getting tremendous feedback from the communities. Um, or actually, it's not just anecdotal. We're getting information. We're taking, uh, uh, it's, called, it's, it's called the sentiment meter. If, uh, say, if I'm in Sector 4-4, Adam, uh, I have a smartphone. I'm in an app. A survey will come up. The first question will be a question about New York City, and the next four or five questions will be about trust in the police and safety in the community. And we're compiling that, all, all that information, because we want to make sure that uh, we're doing the best we can and we're being the best police department we can be. So I had, this, I had these ideas back in 2002 when I was in the 4-4, and then um, after being a precinct commander, I was in vice for about 15 months. Very interesting job. Uh, we started up uh, human trafficking uh, task force back then, which is, which is still in place. Uh, I went to narcotics for, for a couple of years. I ran uh, the citywide narcotics unit. This is about, I talked about the ups and downs of, of uh, being in any job, and it, you have to really, you have to be resilient. So when I was the commanding officer of the narcotics division, I was a uh, one-star chief. Uh, I had a team out in Brooklyn South that instead of paying their confidential informants with money that were, you could get from the police department, what they were doing was they were paying them with drugs. So that got, we, in, in, in uh, civil service, you don't really get fired, but uh, you get moved. So being the citywide narcotics commander was a very prestigious job. It was a, it was a, promotional, it was a promotional path. So Commissioner Kelly at the time, uh, and rightfully so, as I think back about what happened, I didn't really probably didn't think that way at the time it happened, but I was removed as the uh, commander of citywide narcotics. Uh, we had an inspector who was the CEO of Brooklyn South Narcotics. He was moved to, and two captains were moved, and they moved me to the detective bureau, which, as it turns out, was, was not too terrible. Uh, I, when I was a lieutenant, I was the uh, CEO of the Manhattan Warren Squad, which was an absolutely another great job. The only thing bad about it was you had to get up at 3 o'clock in the morning. You had to get into work at, at 4.30, and you're knocking on doors by quarter to 5. And it is the best way to lock up the bad guys. They're either coming home or they're still sleeping. And it was, I did that for two years. And again, just uh, the people that you get to meet, uh, you know, never, never, never better people. So after they moved me out of narcotics, I went back to the Fugitive Enforcement Division. I was a chief. I had the Warrant Squad, I had the Cold Case Squad, and I had the Juvenile Squad. Uh, I did that for six years. I think that's the longest I did, ever did any job in the police department. Um, very, you know, it was, uh, it was great work. Um, it was actually a lot of fun. Uh, I was actually thinking about retiring, and then Commissioner Bratton uh, came back. I had worked for him when he was the chief of the transit police in 1990. I worked for him when he was the uh, uh, commissioner the first time in 1994. And uh, lo and behold, they came back 18 years later after they left in 96. Uh, I came up, worked up in his office as, uh, as his XO. And then uh, I was made chief of patrol when the chief of patrol retired. That's a three-star position. And uh, you're responsible for everybody that's uh, working uniform patrol about 16,000 people. I did that for four months, and then I was made chief of department in November of uh, 2014. I don't know if you recall, in November of 2014, it was, uh, it was extremely difficult time uh, to be in law enforcement. Um, the end of November was uh, the Ferguson decision, was the Garner decision, 
and each and every day uh, there were protests in New York City. And it was a, it was a difficult time to be a cop. Uh, that went on for two or three weeks. That culminated in the assassination of uh, Joe Lu, Wen Jen Lu, and his partner, Rafael Ramos, on December 20th, 2014. Um, maybe not a direct result of all the tumult. Uh, the person that ended up killing Joe and uh, Rafael was emotionally disturbed. But uh, nonetheless, it was, a, it was a trying time in, in, in New York City for law enforcement. Uh, we knew we had to work our way out of it. We knew that no matter what happened, people are still calling 911. People are still calling 311. People are still flagging down police officers. So we knew that uh, we just can't quit. It almost brought us to our knees, but it didn't. I think with the advent of neighborhood policing and uh, with all the hard work by uh, the precinct commanders, uh, the tour commanders, the sergeants, and the cops, we were able to, to get back to where we needed to be. Uh, we started neighborhood policing in May of 2015 with four precincts, the 100, the 101 out in the Far Rockaways, and the 33 and the 34 in, in Manhattan North. Uh, busy places, but not the busiest, because if we're going to make a change like this, we have to make sure that uh, we have the logistics right, we have the right number of people, because uh, bottom line, uh, no one's going to put up with crime going up in New York City. Crimes have been on a downward trend since the 90s, since Mayor Dinkins hired a, an additional 6,000 cops back, uh, way back in uh, 1992. Crime has continued to decrease. So just to give you a little perspective, in 1990, there were 2,245 homicides in New York City. Uh, last year, we had 292. Wow. 292 too many, but uh, that's a lot of lives saved, a lot of families kept intact. Uh, back in 1990, we had 5,000 shootings. Uh, last year, we had 790. And uh, back in 1990, we had 600,000 index crimes. Those are those serious crimes. Whenever you hear about crime being up or down, it's murder, rape, robbery, burglary, felony assault, grand larceny, and grand larceny auto. So a lot of progress has been made over the years, uh, a lot of hard work, a lot of sacrifice. And I knew that, uh, you know, back in, in uh, December of 2014, we had to find our way forward. And I think with neighborhood policing, it's really, it's really paid off. Uh, it's not perfect. It's certainly not perfect. Still a lot of challenges. You know, there's eight and a half million people. There's 36,000 cops. Uh, nothing's ever going to be perfect. But we have to make sure we do our best to keep everybody safe in every neighborhood in, in New York City. And we just had a, uh, we just had a shooting a couple of weeks ago in, in uh, Crown Heights. There's an emotionally disturbed person running around pretending to have a gun in his hand, uh, pointing it at people. There were a number of 911 callers. Uh, the police officers from the 7-1 responded and they ended up shooting him. He uh, got into a combat stance and uh, they thought it was a gun. So uh, there's, there's, uh, it's, a, it's a perilous job. That was an absolute tragedy. A young man had a, a history of uh, being emotionally disturbed and uh, now, there's, there's so many issues that have to be dealt with that, uh, you know, be, that go, beyond, uh, go beyond policing. Uh, we're in the midst of an opioid crisis right now, too. Uh, in 2016, uh, we had 1,400 people die of overdoses, uh, most of them being opioid-related in New York City. And you just have to compare that to the number of homicides. There were 335 homicides and 1,400 people OD'd. There were 230 people that were killed in uh, vehicle accidents that year, too. So this is, you know, it's a real crisis. And again, it's not just a problem uh, that uh, the police can, re can, can, can resolve. It's got to be everybody in the city. It's got to be uh, the health department. It's got to be all the other agencies. You know, it's it, the problem, the, the issue, the challenge with policing is in so many areas, um, it, it, it comes down to, to uh, uh, the, the police have to deal with it because no one else is dealing with it. But uh, I think a lot of that is being resolved. Uh, the current mayor has uh, put together a number of great task forces that are doing great work. Uh, I think uh, there'll be the opioid issue uh, challenging, but uh, I think we're making some progress. Uh, so it is, it, it is absolutely an uh, unbelievable challenge, uh, the position that I'm in. But uh, I couldn't, you know, my wildest imagination, uh, I never thought I'd have this job starting out as a transit cop. But uh, 
You know, that I have uh, 36,000 cops. I think it's 16,000 civilians. That's 52,000 people that work for the NYPD. And uh, the work that they do each and every day is absolutely amazing. And uh, I think that uh, New York City is in good hands. Uh, crime continues to go down. We're in April of 2018. We're down 13 homicides so far this year, and we're down about 20 shootings. Uh, again, uh, a lot of great work by NYPD, a lot of great work by the FBI, all the agencies, and uh, quite frankly, a lot of great work by all eight and a half million people that live in this city, because they understand that it all starts with public safety. You know, there's a lot of other cities out there that uh, aren't doing as well. And I think a lot of that has to do with the fact that we started this back in 1992. And uh, to continue that downward uh, trend in crime over that, that long period of time, is, uh, it's really uh, incredible because each and every year when New Year's Eve rolls around December 31st and we look at the crime numbers and that clock ticks uh, past uh, midnight, uh, the clock resets and we start all over and we say to each other each and every year, how are we going to do this again? And, and they do. Thank you very much, Commissioner. Thanks for the great question.